you will not believe what we have in store for you today. I don't know if that was a good hook or not. We'll, we'll ask Erica in just a moment, but uh, welcome to today's live stream. Uh, today's guest is Erica Schneider. Uh, she's a writer, editor, trainer, coach, and consultant. Uh, she is uh, probably known by you for some of her uh, greatest hits across social media. She's written uh, all kinds of really great content about the art of writing, the art of editing, repurposing content, and just sort of life topics in general. Uh, I'm really excited to have her on today where she's going to be focused on writing hooks. So, you know, how do you hook someone's attention? How do you keep someone engaged? Uh, as we all know, of course, in the era of social media and AI content and all of the other things happening right now, uh, it's harder than ever to get attention and certainly to keep it. So we're really excited to, to dive in with Erica and discuss her strategies and frameworks for developing effective hooks and how you can use them in your own writing. Uh, before we bring on Erica, I have a couple of requests as always. Uh, first of all, pop into the chat, say hello. Uh, tell me your favorite color. I uh, just want to see who's here joining us today on today's live stream uh, and get a sense for uh, who we've got with us. Number two, uh, please hit the like and subscribe buttons on our YouTube channel. Uh, first of all, liking the video is going to help other folks find us, discover our content. Uh, we have, I think now, over 100 videos, uh, including clips and live streams from past guests. So you know we're continuously trying to grow the audience there. Uh, secondly, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll stay up to date on all of our upcoming sessions. Uh, we just rolled out a, an amazing uh, ca calendar uh, of upcoming events. We've got a, an update on SEO changes happening in April. We've got uh, the ultimate SaaS content marketing checklist with our friend Jess Joyce. Uh, we've got uh, a session on getting SEO buy-in with the world-renowned Tom Critchlow coming up in May. Uh, and we have a content repurposing workshop with Ross Simmons in June. So you definitely want to stay up to date with all of our upcoming content. Therefore, you should go ahead and hit that subscribe button uh, and make sure you don't miss any of those upcoming sessions. And uh, there's some more being added. We haven't added them yet. Uh, final request for you before we introduce Erica and kick things off. Uh, if you are not already a member of Tofu, Top of the Funnel, our free community, I'd like to invite you today to become a member. Uh, you can join us by visiting yesoptimist.com slash tofu. There's a brief form that you fill out to just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, long story short, we have approximately 3,000, almost 3,000 folks in there. Uh, it's a great mix of freelance people, agency folks, in-house marketers, uh, discussing all kinds of topics related to content marketing, writing, SEO, um, you know, really anything related to marketing and growth. Uh, we've got folks who are you know asking questions, sharing recommendations, sharing content, uh, sharing work opportunities. Uh, it's just a great community. We've got some really awesome folks in there. Some of the, the smartest people in content marketing and SEO are members. So I would love to have you join us as well. Uh, once again, it's totally free. All you have to do is visit yesoptimist.com slash tofu, fill out the form and you can join us there. We'd love to see you in Slack. All right. Uh, all of those announcements out of the way. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm super excited to bring on Erica today, our guest. We're going to be discussing hooks and Erica's strategies and frameworks for grabbing people's attention. Erica, What's hey, up? how are you? Good, how's it going? Good, good, good. Uh, how was my hook? It was pretty good, it was pretty good. <laughs> I think it's a little harder to do like a verbal hook. But <laughs> yeah, verbal hooks are harder and editing hooks in real time is also super hard. So. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, for sure. Well, uh, I'm really excited to to have you on today, and and obviously, you know, you have a, a long career in in writing and editing. What sort of first fascinated you, or how did you kind of get into the topic of hooks? Because that's become you know something that I think a lot of folks know you know you for. Like everything that I feel like I've become a quote unquote expert in, um, it came from uh, from wanting to get better at it myself. So. Uh, the process started when I was head of content at Grizzle and trying to teach myself and a couple other writers how to write hooks because um, mm. we were doing a bit of like social help with some of our clients. Um, and I was also in a Discord community uh, when I first started posting on Twitter and we were kind of just like giving each other feedback on our hooks every day, essentially. Mm. And uh, it became an interesting topic to me. So I started writing about it. Um, and yeah, I'll tell the story. I've got a little slide on like why the hell 
I even know anything about hooks. So I'll talk a bit more, a bit more about the journey. But yeah, just uh, trying to teach myself and then uh, teaching others. That's usually how I learn things. It's my life hack. Totally. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand that. I love I love that there was like sort of a study group there. I'm, I'm excited to hear the the full story on that. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 yeah, I love, I love that. I get the sense that you're the kind of person that you, you know, you sort of dive into a topic and really try to kind of deconstruct it for yourself. And then that really helps you sort of articulate and, and educate other folks as well. Yeah, basically. That's, I mean, when I first started in, in my content marketing career in 2018, I didn't even know what the hell SEO was, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's just a matter of figuring it out. Everything I've done, I, I've got no formal training in marketing, right? So it's all been figuring it out on the job uh, and a bunch of digestion of resources. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, I think that's a that's a whole nother lesson for for folks today on on sort of learning and and uh, growing as a as a marketer. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Well, well, yeah. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about what you're going to share with us today. Today we're diving all into hooks. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to play a little, a tiny little game at the start. Um, to try. <laughs> I've got some funny slides on like what makes a good and bad hook. Um, but basically like the meat of the presentation is the principles behind good hooks. Uh, you know, everyone has, has their own number of how many principles they think that there are. I used to think there were four and now I've decided there are seven. There's no actual number, but you know, I've got seven in the presentation. Um, and so we'll just talk about, you know, what makes a good hook, what makes a bad hook, um, how, to, how to make hooks more specific. And then I personally learned uh, how to write really well from frameworks. So they work for mm -hmm. some people. They don't really vibe with others. That's totally fine. I'm going to include some at the end. Um, and yeah, that's the that's the presentation. Great. Well, uh, I'm excited to dive in. Uh, if you want to go ahead and pull that up, uh, and while she's doing that, uh, I'll just make a quick mention. Uh, first of all, as Erica's going through this, if you have questions for her, uh, feel free to pop those in the chat. Uh, if it's super relevant, we might jump in and, and try to answer the question in real time. But for the most part, we'll, we'll save those questions for the end. Uh, hopefully, we'll have at least a few minutes to answer those. Um, so yeah, please feel free to chime in throughout the presentation uh, as needed. Cool. Let me bring this up here. Cool. Well, uh, well, once again, yeah, I'm excited to, to learn from you as well, Erica. Uh, I'll let you go ahead and take it away from here. Amazing. Okay. So today we're talking about writing hooks, how to grab and keep attention. Uh, we're not going to dive into like how to write a good body. Um, but basically the idea with the keeping attention is that if you have a really good hook um, and you deliver on the promise in the hook, then you'll basically, that's like, at least 50, if not more percent of how you keep attention. Um, but yeah, the body is a whole other, a whole other presentation, but yeah. Okay. So if you don't know who the hell I am, my name is Erica Schneider. So on the left, we've got some creds. So I was the former head of content at a content marketing agency that served mostly B2B, uh, SaaS businesses. We were driving organic traffic, um, for them, mostly through blog writing. Um, so I did that for four and a half years, two years ago, 2022, uh, the head, the founder and CEO of Grizzle, uh, Tom Watley challenged all of us to start posting on social. There's power in a personal brand, all of that. Um, I hated the idea. I had actually stopped posting on personal socials back in 2020. I just was sick of it. Um, so it was uncomfortable. Um, actually, hold on. He challenged us in 2021. Um, I posted a few times on, on Twitter, I absolutely hated it. And then I was like, screw this. And I quit. Um, so yeah, I, um, I can see the questions by the way, Tyler, I don't know if you want me to, to address any of them, but, um, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer the three million, the three million words thing. Um, so fast forward from 2021 to beginning of 2022, I started posting on LinkedIn and, uh, liked it which is surprising because it depends on who you are. Some people hate Twitter. Some people hate LinkedIn. Um, and everyone says, don't do them at the same time, which is actually sound advice. But I started on, on LinkedIn and then I went back to Twitter and I just grew on both at the same time, which was a bit insane. So I spent a lot of um, time and I wasted a lot of my life for, for like a year building an audience. Um, but I had nothing else, you know, 
I was waiting for for my twins to come. So I I was really anxious mentally and it was a good time to distract myself. Um, so long story short, I've now got 80,000 across both those platforms. And I've calculated the 3 million words thing. It's not an exact number, but basically when I was head of content, I was editing a, about 2,000 words a day. Um, some days a thousand, some days, you know, five to 10,000. And if you multiply that by like five business days a week, a week over like four to five ish words, you get 3 million. So don't, don't, don't like love me or hate me or if it's not we, exactly 3 million. We won't, we won't fact check you on that. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then for the, the life stuff on the right, I love seltzer. If you're not from America, um, that is soda or sparkling water. Um, it's my favorite drink. I've got a can next to me pretty much all day, every day. Um, in 2016, I, uh, I don't know why I wrote a song. I wrote a rap song, a white girl rap song about seltzer. Um, and if you're curious, you can go to YouTube and type in Erica Schneider seltzer water and there is a music video. Um, so that's the seltzer water thing. Um, in December of last year, um, my wife carried and gave birth to our twins. So, I've got a boy and a girl twin. Uh, they are almost 16 months old. They are insane. Um, and they take up a lot of my my time, but I love them. And I call myself an entrepreneur in progress because I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to be super successful, but I just left my job in October and I'm doing my best to figure it out and I'm having a lot of fun. But I'm not against ever getting a job again. Um, I, I hate the whole nine to five versus entrepreneur battle. I think both are good at different seasons in your life. So that's my rant. Okay. That's about me. Uh, why the hell am I qualified to talk about hooks? Um, so that's subjective. Um, but I think I am because I have, uh, had a pretty successful course on it and, uh, at, over 700 people have bought it. Um, I, it's a course collaboration. The V3 over here is a collaboration. V1 was, um, I can do a whole other presentation on, on iterations of courses. I did a 27 page ebook and sold it for $27 in like 2022. Then I got feedback that people wanted more. So I doubled the length and doubled the price. And I had like a notion presentation, uh, on it for 40 something dollars. And then everybody was asking me like nine months later, how they could use AI to help them write hooks faster. And I collaborated with Rob Lennon, who's like the most amazing AI person, and now our like flagship product together is hooked on writing hooks. Um, it's 147 bucks. Uh, and it's, it's cool. Cause it's like the principles that I'm going to walk you through today, but then every single thing can be AI powered and you can like, it's like a playground. You can play, it, it'll write hooks for you. You can make things more specific if it's general, things like that. Super fun. Um, so yeah, I think that was a, a bit of a new course format too. Um, putting a subject matter expert with an AI expert and, and making it like a, learning slash play experience. Um, and the social media dude at ConvertKit likes it. So that's a fun testimonial. Okay. What we're going to talk about today, why hooks matter, what makes a great hook, what makes a bad hook, how to write a great hook. If there's time at the end, which I, there probably won't be, but if there is, we can do a little hook writing exercise. If not, I'll just give you some homework and you can ping me on social and maybe I'll roast your hook if I have time. Cool. Okay, why do hooks matter? So there's another interesting debate here amongst a lot of marketers, especially like seasoned marketers that are not used to writing on social or have gotten really good at another format. And, and I personally used to feel this way too. Um, it's interesting. If, if, you, if you understand the art of writing, you can sometimes look at a hook and be like, why would I like write clickbaity nonsense to get attention. Like, I don't need to do that. I'm above that, right? A lot of people feel that way. Um, my answer to that is you have a split second and one sentence to hook people's attention on social. And so you have to play the game full stop. It just matters. If you don't have a strong hook, people aren't going to read your stuff. People stop scrolling because of emotions primarily, which all of the seven principles that we're about to talk about uh, touch upon. So if you don't like make them feel something, they're really not going to stop. Once you've built authority and affinity and all of that, like you can probably like Justin Walsh can get people to read his stuff if he just says like, hi, you know what I mean? But you can't do that. <laughs> like I can't do that. You know, you have to have something that makes people stop. Um, and obviously, like, I think we're all marketers here. It's not going to work 
if it's not tailored to your audience, if it's not like, you know, if, if, if you're not trying to build some sort of authority around a topic, right? Like you can't just talk about everything all the time for no reason. It has to be targeted. It has to be strategic. But, you know, that's I'm hoping that that's kind of 101 um, because everything about a good hook builds on the fact that you are actually talking about something um, that is interesting to your audience. Right. So that involves knowing who you are, knowing what you want to talk about and knowing who your audience is. Like all of that plays into being able to do this well. Um, OK, <clears throat> if you don't believe me that a sentence can can make a difference. Look at these and put in the chat which one of these does not make you want to read it, does not make you want to read it. So I'll read them out loud if you can't see it. Number one, <clears throat> three tall, dark men strode towards her as she limped along the muddy jungle track. Number two, three bad digital writing habits to stop ASAP. Number three, simple but powerful keyword research tip. Number four, when you take that first step, the universe rewards you with a bit more clarity. Number five, the wellness industry is figuring out performance. Number six, so much content created fails to resonate, not because of lack of resources or technique, but something else. <laughs> Matthew says four, five, and six are equally bad. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'd pause it two and three, okay? Number four does not make you want to stop. Yeah. Okay. So, so the reason why four, five, and six are not that interesting, yeah, they're not that interesting, right? So the first one is quite interesting because you're you're so curious about what this person is going to say that you kind of have to click because you want to know. Um, number two is a very standard hook. Um it, it just does a good job. It's got a quantifier. So three, it's not saying here's here's all the bad writing tips. It's got one number that you should stop at ASAP. Like you're, you're probably going to be interested in that if you're a writer. Um, simple but powerful keyword research tip. It, sound, you can, it sounds like it's going to be easy to read. So you just want to like, you want to, right? You're skimming. You might learn something interesting. Number four is just weird. Like when you take that first step, the universe rewards you with a bit more clarity. Can you dislike all of them? <laughs> You can do whatever the hell you want. You can dislike as many hooks as you want. That is totally fine. Um, this is a this is a safe space. Um, when you take that first step, the universe rewards you with a bit more clarity. Like I have absolutely no idea what I'm gonna get from reading that. I, there's just nothing. There is nothing that makes the reader objectively feel good about reading that. I just don't know. Number you, you have to take the first step so you can get a bit more clarity. <laughs> Kimberly. Oh man. Yeah. Number one is quite intense, but I still want to read it. I'm curious. Yeah. Number four needs way more clarity. Um, number five, I don't, I don't know why I should care. Like I'm sort of like, okay, that's an opinion, but I don't know, like, a, what do I, what do I care? What am I going to learn? Like if I'm scrolling quickly, I'm probably not going to click on it. Um, and number six, so much content created fails to resonate, not because of lack of resources, but something else like it's, it's trying to be a good hook, but it's a little wordy and confusing. And again, like not very targeted. So my point here is that this sentence matters. Like all of you just had like very strong feelings about these. And this is what you see. Like, I think it's like 60 or 70% of people on LinkedIn um, are scrolling on their phones. So you only see one sentence. Um, yeah, it's trying to get us to click see more. You have to, this is what you see on mobile. So like, you will only see this and you, and <laughs> this is a spicy group. I'm glad I joined the chat. <laughs> oh man, I hope you like my good examples or else like I might as well just, fuck, I'm going to get booed off stage. Um, okay. Uh, you need to capture people's attention in one sentence. Love it or hate it, you have one sentence. That's, that's the point of this slide. Uh, there's a difference between good and bad clickbait. So all hooks are clickbait. Like let's just, let's just agree on that like the whole purpose of clickbait is to get people to click that is fine the reason why we hate the word is because buzzfeed ruined it for us right um they tell us we're gonna see some like amazing shit and we just don't um and it's annoying but my my way of looking at it is like look we're all trying to hook people 
the bad people, what who I call like the marketing bros um, and people that are, you know, super young, inexperienced, have they're like 18 and they claim that they've been working on something for like 15 years. It's really weird. Um, so they're intentionally deceiving, they're sensationalizing, they're embellishing, misleading and overpromising, right? And then good clickbait strategically builds emotional resonance and is anchored by a valuable body, right? Like it's totally fine to use clickbait if you are not being an asshole and you are delivering on your promise. So you can quote me on that. Okay. Um, so let's just have a quick laugh. This is an example of terrible clickbait. Um, and this is what happens when uh, people kind of steal each other's templated hooks and then they all sound the same and then I make a collage. Um, so this is when the illegal to know hook was everywhere. I'm really glad that it's stopped. Um, but you know, my point is if you resort to templates and if you just try to copy what other people are doing to capture attention, you are going to look like this, right? Which is everyone else. You're going to have no real personality. We all hated this trend. It should be illegal. <laughs> um, you know, and, and it's just like obvious that it just feels like you're trying too hard, right? So there's a more strategic, better way. Um, to do it where you don't have to be these people. Okay. So what makes a great hook? Um, in my opinion, there are seven principles. So let's go through them. Okay. Principle number one, you want to poke at pain. Now, again, marketers, apparently we're all very sensitive because I see these debates all the time. We shouldn't poke at people's pain. Um, you know, we don't want to make people feel bad, all of that. Like, okay, that's all well and good. But when we say poke at pain, we literally are just saying, like, relate to their pain. Maybe that's what we should call it. Relate to their pain instead of poke at their pain. Um, you, are <laughs> you are showing people that you understand what the hell they're struggling with, right? And that is a really strong way to hook people. So on the left, these are, so by the way, these are structured, like pretend there's a line in the middle. This is hook one, this is hook two. They're not part of the same post. Um, so this is one that I've written. So most people don't know how to edit their work, which is unfortunate because, right? There's nothing like happy there. Like this is me poking at pain. But if you're someone who doesn't know how to edit their work, which is a lot of people, you're going to read this and go, oh shit, like that's me. And it's going to make you feel something and you're going to want to click into it. <laughs> um, on the right, tactical posts never helped me grow on LinkedIn, but I tried them for years because I thought they'd eventually work. I was about to give up on posting when I stumbled upon something that changed everything. Right. So here you're using a, a bit of another principle, which is to leave a cliffhanger or leave an open open loop. But everything in red is poking at the pain. Cool. Moving right along. Add credibility. So you don't want to do this in every single post because then it's just going to seem like you're, you know, obsessed with yourself, essentially. Um, but this is my pinned thread on Twitter, the hook for it. Um, and it just reads like I've edited 3 million words. Here are eight common uh, content writing mistakes and how to fix them. Right. So my, my credibility is big. It's like in a banner. And then here are these writing mistakes and how to fix them. Like, that's cool. Okay. This person knows what they're talking about. They're going to help me. On the right, we've spent five years building systems that net us 2 million ARR. We were bootstrapped and have never taken any money from investors. Okay, cool. So I assume the next sentence is going to tell me how um, I can do something similar or the story or whatever. Um, so cool, cool. Number three, build intrigue. So this is kind of like... Um, like that first one where she was telling that weird kind of almost like romance novelly weird story before, but it's intriguing. It's interesting. Like we are, we can't help ourselves. We want to know what's going to happen. Right. Um, so I used to be riddled with self doubt, insecurity, and limited beliefs. But two years ago, I made a decision that changed my life for the better. Right. That's really intriguing. I want to know what that decision was. And then on the right, the truth about trolls, bullies, and haters is less interesting than you think. So all you're do doing is planting a seed in someone's mind that they almost like need to follow up on. Or like a, you're, you're starting a thread and you have to see where it's going to go. 
Cool. Right, leave a cliffhanger. So I, I mentioned that a minute ago, but um, this is one of my favorite styles of a hook. You just start with a quote or like a series of three quotes that are super relatable um, to what your audience is going through at the moment. So um, one of my really popular posts, I um, I chose three hypothetical quotes that like influencers give about editing that I disagree with. And I put them like one, two, three. And then I was like, this advice sucks. Like here's what to do instead or something. Um, and so that's totally one way that you could do a hook. So this one is about um, people who are obviously struggling with imposter syndrome or feeling confident. And then you're leaving a massive cliffhanger. Like you're leaving, you're asking yourself the wrong questions like instead, right? So if these quotes resonate with you, you kind of have to read this, right? Okay. And then most people make this one big mistake when it comes to growing on LinkedIn. Another cliffhanger. Okay. Inspire others. So it's a, it can be a bit, a bit braggy like the one on the left, but that's actually something I've written before and it doesn't come across as braggy if you don't say it all the time. I, I think I talk about my product numbers like once every few months. Um, I, I don't talk about them every day. Some people are out there just being annoying about how much money they make all the time. So much so that you're like, this can't possibly be real, you know? So don't do that. Um, but it's cool, right? So this is me talking about the the hooks course that I that I made. And uh, it was a really exciting day when it crossed 90K and, and it, I wanted to share it. And, and it was like a nice conversation that came from it. Um, so it's inspiring to anyone that, you know, wants to make a course as well. Um, and then if time is your biggest struggle to growing on LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever you are, this post is for you. So that's kind of like another more like subtle inspiration. Like I'm going to help you get through something, go from a current state to a future desired state. Um, okay. Who knows Wes K.O.? Anyone? She was like the co-founder of Maven. Um, I don't know what she's doing now. She's been around. Um, it's it's W E S space K A O. She is an absolute thought leader on something called a spiky point of view. It's really cool um, philosophy that I I've read a lot about, and I try to inject as many spicy points of views as I can into my writing because they're intentionally. I don't know if polarizing is the right word, but they are structured in a way where somebody has to disagree with you. Um, and that's just another thing about social. Like you shouldn't try to write to get everyone to agree with you. Like I try to, I, all the time I try to get people to disagree with me um, because I'm coming, like I'm coming at it from an angle that you might not have thought about before. And so I want to challenge you to think about it differently. And I don't want, I don't want to have a fight with you. I just want to have like a constructive conversation about something right? Um, but it's also a good way to repel people that are not your audience. So I'll say something super bold. Intentionally, I know it's going to like poke someone over here, which is totally fine because I don't really, like, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not trying to work with you. And it also works to like attract people that are in your world that you do want to work with because they want to get behind you as like feeling really strongly about something, right? Yeah. Strong point of view. Um, but it's more than a strong point of view. A spicy point of view is like, you know, it's something that you've thought really, really hard about, um, and it absolutely will spike people, I guess is the best way to put it. So I've got a secret to tell you. Your boss is tired of being your manager. They want you to manage them. Like, that's such a weird, like a weird mind fuck. I don't know if I can curse here, but um, yeah, cool. Um, why would I, why would I manage my boss? Like, I don't get paid enough for that, you know? So it's like, people are totally going to disagree with that, which is really cool. Like, that's her point. Um, here's how to get what you want and give your boss what they need. And really, she's trying to help you um, probably make more money eventually by being someone who manages their boss. But it, when you read that at first, you're like, no, absolutely not. Um, and then on the right, it's hard, if not near impossible, to learn how to think strategically by reading a book. So there's definitely people out there that read tons of books that claim they've changed their lives. And they're going to be in these comments like, what the fuck? Like, I read this book and it changed everything for me. Like, how dare you? You know? 
which is awesome because that's exactly what you want. Okay, loss aversion. Uh, basically, if you don't know what it means, it, we are we are more inclined to um, stop losing, stop the act of losing something we care about. Uh, we care more about not losing things we care about than like winning something else. If that makes sense. So like, if I have something that's working for me. Um, I'm going to fight for it and do everything I can to not lose that. Um, instead of like going after this new thing. Um, so it's a really interesting psychological, um, bias. Caitlin Borgoyne writes about it a lot. If you know her and her email is great. Uh, so yeah, on the left, LinkedIn can ban your account. Don't wait to start a newsletter. So if you're someone who has amassed really strong connections on LinkedIn or Twitter, and you don't want to lose them. And I'm telling you, you might lose them. You're going to be like, you're going to feel really empowered to go do something to not lose them. Uh, if you're someone who has not spent any time on LinkedIn and you don't care and you read that, you're not going to care. Right. So like you're speaking to people again, targeted, you know, your audience is going to care. You would never say this if your audience doesn't give a shit. Right. And on the right, you can spend 40 hours a month on sales calls or book two to three dream clients a month on autopilot with the right funnel. So this person wants to, you know, they've been losing their time and they want to win it back. So you're tapping into that again. Like you have, you have lost touch with like why you even became an entrepreneur, which is like freedom of time. So let me help you type thing. And yes, this is all tapping into to human nature. Okay. So those were the seven across all seven, depending on your goal. So obviously this is, this is top of top of funnel. Like we all know what that means. Hopefully then there's middle and bottom. Um, you don't want to write every single hook for every single person. So you want to have like wide hooks sometimes where you just say like, I help people do whatever. Um, and sometimes you want to get really specific and say, I help, you know, B2B SaaS executives at C-Day startups, right? Like sometimes you want to get that specific. So it depends. So generally across all of these principles, um, getting more specific is a good way to like really, again, attract the right people, repel the wrong ones. Um, and when you use numbers and specificity, it's way more memorable. It stands out more. So on the left, you can say struggling to send good DMs. And on the right, struggling with how to send DMs that will generate responses on LinkedIn, right? So now it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know where you're talking about it. And here it's not just sending DMs, but I actually want responses from them, right? Okay, so let's do a, a tiny little exercise. So here's a tweet that Patrick Campbell wrote last year. Uh, the topic is how to nurture a team of high performers. So I've hired 133 people, sold millions in software, zero funding. Want to know what holds your company back from being high performers? You treat your team like children. Let me explain. So this is very, very compelling. If I'm someone in a position of leadership that wants to make a way more money than I'm making, and I want to have a team of A players that are just killing it, right? So put in the chat, how can I make this less specific? I've highlighted the specificity. How do I make this less specific? Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> <laughs> So, so just to just to be clear, uh, is your recommendation that you have sort of a mix of super specific and less specific content, or, or how do you generally approach that? Yeah. So, so my point was generally specific is better because it's more memorable. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with having a bit of broad, like less specific words if you're trying to reach a broader audience and do like super top of funnel awareness building stuff. So, okay, hired uh, hired people, sold software. Yep, exactly, that's good. 
Want to know what's holding you back? Love it. Do you know your team? Oh, how do you know your team is performing? I think. Yeah. You treat your team like children. I've hired lots of people, sold some software, never talked to a VC. Want to know what's holding your company back? Treat them right. Okay. Cool. So um, I basically think it's it's really simple. It's just I've hired tons of people, sold a lot of software, and then you would just kill that next sentence, right? So you wouldn't even have that level of specificity. And then want to know what's holding your team back? You treat them badly. So that is way less compelling, in my opinion, than this one here with all the details. But it's interesting because if if you go and and I encourage you to go after this workshop and go scroll around on on whichever platform you enjoy, and just first of all, good exercise in general. Um, and I do this all the time. If something captures your attention, screenshot it, save it, whatever, copy paste it, um, and put it in a little folder. Uh, because it's good to kind of capture the things that move you because it'll show you kind of why and what works. And then maybe you can recreate that feeling in your own, in your own work, but also go through and just, just look, uh, at if people are being specific or not, because generally if you, if you just say like, I've done a bunch of stuff, I've sold a bunch of stuff and you know, but you're, but you're being held back and I have all the answers and here you go. Like, you're not really, it's one of those things where you're speaking to everyone, so you're speaking to no one. It's hard to follow. So just keep an eye out for that because there's just tons of tons of non-specific hooks out there, and there's always an opportunity to add a bit more color to them. Cool. Okay. What makes a bad hook? This section's quite short. We've kind of covered it in the in the clickbait bit, but we all know uh, we should be clear not clever, right? So the, the one on the top left, ever wondered how an electric scooter and a beach day might offer key marketing insights? Like, I read that and I'm like, I've got no idea where you're going with this. And I've never wondered that. And I'm sure there's some metaphor here, but I don't care. And I scroll past, right? People do this all the time. They're like, I've got the most amazing metaphor. This is going to be awesome. I'm thinking so brilliantly about this. And you just lose them. So don't try to be, to be, clever. Uh, no reason to care. Like nobody cares you've rebranded. Nobody cares that you've changed your name. Like nobody cares about that stuff in the hook. Like, it's not that we don't care. We just don't care in the hook. Like that is not good enough in a hook, like lead with the problem that you were having. And then you solved it with a rebrand or you solved it with changing your name or whatever. But like these things of like, we've rebranded, we've done this, like nobody really cares. The only thing that you can get away with there is on LinkedIn when you're like, I've got a new job because they boost those posts. Uh, the premise is a bit confusing, right? So company strategy should be a priority for senior leaders, but not the first one. Like, I don't, I, I, like, I, I don't know what, you're, is that a spiky point of view? Like company strategy needs, needs to be, a, like, I don't understand. So I'm just confused where, where you're going. And so you've created a friction point for me and I'm thinking too hard and I don't want to think that hard because I'm on social. So I'm scrolling past. Um, just a few more of our, of our bro friends over here. These are their favorite styles. I can teach you more in two minutes than you learned in four years of university. Like, no, you can't, um, follow these LinkedIn growth tips and you'll be better than 99% of people. No, you won't. Um, the secret to how I earn 500 K a month and only work four hours a week. That's not true. Right? Cool. So don't do that. Um, and then you don't know what you'll get from reading. So, in a recent online discussion, I came across someone dis discussing CAC, customer acquisition costs, and LTV, lifetime value metrics. Like, okay, again, like, I feel like I'm reading, <laughs> I feel like I'm reading a journal entry. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know why you're writing this. Um, so yeah, I don't, just don't, don't do any of this. Cool. Um, I really like to, I love to roast myself. I think it's the best way to, um, I think it's good for two reasons. Number one, it helps kind of show you that here I am pretending to be this hook expert, right? That's subjective. Um, I used to suck and now I suck less. So that's exciting. Um, this is a really good way, by the way, to 
talk about yourself on social. Um, I one of my one of the the first ever LinkedIn posts of mine that took off was when I was uh, roasting myself about like sentences I wrote uh, in blogs when I was first starting. Like, who can't relate to that? It's hilarious. Like, so uh, this is a great you know way to just kind of have some fun, poke some fun at yourself. Um, so on the left. This is this is super cool though. My favorite part of this is the dates. So this these are only a few months apart. Um, that's how quickly I was like, shit, like I suck and I want to get better. Um, so this doesn't have to take very long, right? On the left, like thread storytelling is becoming a buzzword. Use storytelling, inject storytelling. We need to bring the value uh, behind the word back into focus. And then it's just like kind of a table of contents. Um, there's absolutely nothing compelling about that hook, but I remember writing it and being like, oh my God, like everyone's going to read this. You know, this is so cool. Um, it doesn't, it's just very, very unclear. Um, and then on the right, again, don't come for me for this. Um, Rob Lennon, my friend back in the day, um, actually edited this hook for me when I wrote it and he put this stat in and I remember thinking I should check if that's true. And then I just didn't. So again, sometimes these things happen. Um, Two, two million articles are published every day on the web. Almost none use story properly. Storytelling, five steps to be more persuasive, interesting, and memorable. That's way more interesting. There's emotions tied to that. Like, I want to know, if I give a shit about storytelling, I want to know, okay, why aren't they using them properly? And what can I do instead? That's so much more interesting than whatever this, you know, shit show was on the left. Okay? Cool. I think we've got enough time for a few frameworks. So how to write a great hook. Again, these are the frameworks that I used when I first started. Um, they are useful if you are trying to um, <clears throat> draw people in with more than just one sentence. Like there's the one sentence or like two sentence hooks that we went through, but especially on Twitter, if that happens to be the platform you're on, people can see more than one sentence. They can see up to four, right? So it also depends on the platform. So when I was studying hooks like crazy, I was writing mostly on Twitter. And so these work really, really well there, but they also work on LinkedIn. You just have to make sure that that first sentence on LinkedIn is like super good. So these are the three structures that I have in my course. In the course, I explain, uh, <laughs> um, I explain these in detail and I've got like a bunch of examples of each of them. And then Rob Lennon built AI bots based on these three frameworks um, where you can kind of say, I want to write about this. And it will spit out three different hook ideas for you based on these frameworks. So it's super, super cool. Um, so I'm going to walk you through these frameworks. Okay. SCQA. Situation, challenge, question, answer. This works, by the way, all three of these. these all three of these work for um, blog introductions, email, um, whatever you write, like these frameworks are absolutely universal. I've written entire like 2,500 word blogs where the, the, the first section H2, the first H2 situation, the second H2 challenge. Then you ask a, like a question as a transition. Um, and then the last, um, H2 is kind of your answer, your solution, your bridge, right? So you can, you can use these frameworks at a, at a micro and a macro level. I absolutely love frameworks. They helped me become a good writer. Um, okay, so you're so you're setting the stage, then you're poking the pain a bit with the challenge, then you're building intrigue, and then you're dangling the, the solution. Amanda Natividad, if you don't know her, go hit follow on every platform she's on. She is like the queen of hooks. Um, I basically st studied her, to be honest. Um, so <clears throat> this is one of her most viral um, ideas, and she's now known as the zero click person because of this. So it's a tough world out there for creators. That's a situation. That's that's just a situation. Um, it's an opinionated situation, but it's a situation. Then she has some data. By the way, so this is just me annotating what this says. It's this. It's the same thing. Over half of Google searches end without a click, right? So she's just supplementing her claim a bit, which makes which is like the key to making an argument stronger. Um, and we're still we're still challenging now. We're poking at the pain. So we've introduced the situation, backed it up with data. Now we are challenging you. We're presenting the challenge. Social media platforms ding you for linking out, right? So clicks are out is basically the premise here. What to do? And now the answer. 
beat the platforms at their own game. Make zero click content. Here's how. Right. So that's really, really like that is that is SCQA like to the T. Beautifully done. Cool. TAS, thesis, antithesis, 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 whatever, um, solution. Okay. You're presenting an opinion. You are recognizing a barrier and then you're sharing your way through. Okay. Here's one that I wrote for Grizzle when I was there. Thesis. So here's our opinion. Um, bad content is thin, unhelpful, and makes people remember to forget, forget you. Right. And then this is still our thesis. Quality content is the only content worth making. Antithesis, right? The barrier though, is basically, it's really fucking hard to make quality content. It's not easy. Um, so anyone that says it's easy is lying. That's just my way of being like, I understand the state of play here. Like I, I see people preach, just make quality content, just make quality content, right? So that's kind of like a, a little wink, 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 nod to my audience here. And if you're someone that understands that it's hard, I'm like, I'm really talking to you. So that's another way for us to kind of like, I'm building emotional resonance and relatability with my audience. And then the synthesis, right? So, so my way through, we've spent seven years building scalable systems that prioritize quality and drive conversions. Here's our playbook. <clears throat> I could have gotten even more specific here and said they've driven, you know, X results for our clients or whatever. So there's always room to get more specific. I don't remember why I didn't, um, but that would be a way to do that. Cool. Okay. One more. PAS. Everyone loves this framework. Problem, agitate, solution. So you're identifying the problem up front. You are poking the pain to increase that relatability. And then you are presenting a solution. Ah, here. I knew I had it in here somewhere. This was that LinkedIn post. I think this was like one of the first 10 LinkedIn posts that I ever wrote that did really well. So the problem, everybody sucks when they first start writing. Look at this hook I wrote in 2018. <laughs> it's terrible. Most of us use credit cards on a daily basis. Like, holy shit, that was, that was the opener to my intro to a blog in 2018. Terrible. Um, solution, here are five mistakes I made in year one and how I'd fix them today. Right? Cool. Okay. Oh. So I don't know if you guys want to do Q and A or if you want to do a little exercise, um, totally up to you how you want to use the last 10 minutes. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what I've got for you. Erica, that was amazing. Uh, I love those, I love those frameworks. Uh, so yeah, folks, uh, first of all, while, while we're sort of chatting up here, uh, pop into the chat, let us know, first of all, if you have any questions for Erica or want to go back over through any of these specific ones. Uh, otherwise, I guess, yeah, we can, we'd, we'd love to, uh, uh, give feedback or, uh, or see some, some attempts at some hooks based on, based on these, uh, yeah, I'm more than happy to roast, to roast a hook if you want. Um, let me just pull this up too. I'm going to share with you all, um, because I'm in a good mood. Um, so I've got a, a personal hooks database, and this is also in my course for anyone that already has it. Um, so you'll recognize it. But I've got, I don't know, sorry, let me just find it here. I've got a personal swipe file is what I'm trying to say. Terrible at multitasking. Um, I've got a personal swipe file of um, like a hundred hooks and mm -hmm. it's, they're all annotated. Um, so let me, I can share this tab in, instead. Can you see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is the old book of hooks. This is version two, this, this whole thing that lived in Notion. It doesn't live here anymore, but the database still does. And so I've got, um, you can, you can do it by category, um, platform, LinkedIn or Twitter, or the person's name. Um, and you can see the category, where it is, who it is, um, mm -hmm. and then my annotated version of it. And then you can click onto it as well. Um, so I think it's, it's really helpful if you're kind of staring at your screen and you're like, what the hell 
should I write <laughs> today to have these kind of like annotated frameworky things, uh, you know, as, as fodder. So um, okay. I, will, I will pop that here in the chat if you all can. Oh, no, didn't work. Don't know why. Um, no worries. I'll, uh, get, I'll get it to Tyler. He'll get it to you. Yeah, let's say if you pop into the, you should have a private chat on oh, the tabs yeah. over there. You can pop in there. I can post it into the actual LinkedIn here. Cool. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know how well this is going to play, but we will post this uh, in Tofu as well. I'll get that link over to Tofu. Um, and then, yeah, before we jump into the questions, thanks y'all for for posting in the chat here. Uh, of course, the other way to uh, to to get a hold of Erica if you have questions or if you want to check out her course and and learn more about her uh, on Twitter, Erica is my Erica's my name. Sorry, not is <laughs> <laughs> Erica's my name. Uh, and then, uh, of course, she's on uh, on LinkedIn and, and other uh, other spots as well. As I mentioned, I will post that link that she just shared in Tofu. So if you haven't joined us there, uh, hit up yesoptimist.com slash Tofu. Uh, let's get into these questions. Um, okay, so Lauren was asking, uh, do you, you know, I guess maybe uh, I can add another question here to you. So first of all, do you have like a go-to framework of the ones that you shared? Uh, and also maybe do you, do you approach that differently for brand accounts versus personal accounts? Yeah, so I think my, my go-to for a while was SCQA because... I use it so much in blog writing that it just kind of, it just kind of stuck with me. Um, now, and I think this is kind of important to, to say, I don't ever think about frameworks. So the cool part about mm -hmm. frameworks is you study them, you have them side by side, you're kind of filling in the blanks and then you do them so often that they just become ingrained in you. So like, I don't ever think about frameworks anymore um, or these principles or any of that, but I definitely used to when I started. Um, but yeah, I think SCQA is, is it was the, it was the one that I was having the most fun with. Um, mm. so yeah, I, I would definitely pick that one. Cool. And then, yeah, do you approach any differently or, or any thoughts on brand accounts versus personal accounts? Honestly, not really. Brand accounts are, are, are a hard really hard <laughs> to, to grow. <laughs> um, nobody's like intentionally looking for brand accounts anymore. You know, they're looking for the person. Um, so I don't have too much insight on brand accounts and I, I don't really want to pretend that I do. I wish I did. Um, I guess just be, uh, be relatable. Don't just like I, the brand accounts that just post like a link to something like link, link, link all the time. Like that's not going to do well. That used to be fine. It doesn't do well anymore. You you do have to figure out your your own way of having zero click content too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. brand accounts are tricky. I don't know. Do you have a brand a brand account? Do you, what do you? How are you finding it, Tyler? We we have one for Tofu uh, that David, uh, our community manager, he he runs it, um, and he's mostly just kind of reusing. You know, I think it's one of those things where it's like it's a pretty low priority. You know, it's like keep it alive. You know, you might as well post. You know, if you're gonna if you're already sharing stuff on other accounts, you might as well post it there too kind of thing. But, uh, but yeah, we don't spend a whole lot of time trying to perfect it. Uh, you know, I do think it's sort of, there's sort of algorithm bias against the brand accounts in some, uh, yeah. some cases as well. So I yeah, so. it does make it more challenging for sure. Yeah. Uh, so this is a good question from Amy. Uh, how spiky is too spiky? <laughs> so is, I, just just for context. <laughs> yes. So, so for context, that's the referring to the spiky POV, uh, yeah framework or, or sorry, that's not a framework well anyway yeah go ahead yeah yeah no it's just the spiky point of view argument look that's entirely up to you um and mm -hmm. and like what you're about and your audience so it's funny like there's a fine line between having a spiky point of view and just being an asshole right so <laughs> like if you feel like you're being an asshole it's probably too spiky if you feel like you're speaking like creatively or thinking about something differently and you also feel passionate about it and you don't feel like an asshole, maybe kind of, but not like totally, then it's probably fine. Let mm. me, um, uh, Wes Kale has written like a whole article on this, um, that I'll, I'll send to Tyler now too. Um, it's titled spiky point of view. Let's get a little controversial. I highly recommend it. And I highly recommend following Wes. Cause she, like, I think she trained Amanda Natividad who then like, I've studied like crazy when I was, when I was learning and it's, it's just, she's like amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it, it probably also depends. I would I would guess uh, you kind of how you follow that up, right? Like it's one thing to lead with a spiky point of view, but if you're delivering value or like helping people understand why you have that point of view, I think that's a totally different strategy than if you're just saying something to be like controversial. Totally, totally. Yeah, if you're being if you're being controversial for no reason, that's one thing. If you're, it's like the purpose behind it. Like there's tons of people that are controversial just to get clicks, like just because they, they, nothing else is working and they're like, I'll just say something controversial. Um, if you're saying something controversial for a good reason and you've thought about it hard and you've got something to back it up and you're willing to kind of debate about it, um, mm -hmm. then yeah, that's fine. Great. Uh, Amy had a second question, which is, do you try to connect your hook with your call to action or does it matter? Yeah, this is a, another really good question, Amy. Um, I personally believe that, so I don't, I wouldn't call it my call to action. I would call it my takeaway. So in my mind, mm. there's four parts of a social post. There's the hook, the body, the takeaway and the CTA, which is optional. Like I don't have a CTA in every post. Um, but I, I think of the CTA as, um, you know, uh, I'm who I, I'm Eric Schneider. Like I'm this, like follow me for more of this. Like that to me, that's a CTA. Um, a takeaway is a final thought, um, a statement that's going to empower you to think about something more, uh, take an action, um, whatever that, that may be. And so I absolutely tie my hooks to my takeaways. Um, I think that your takeaway should, should echo your hook. Um, and I have like a whole, a whole slide on this that, I can try to find really quickly elsewhere. Um, it's so, so, so important. The best, the best takeaway and hook combination. And this is, so here's an exercise you can try at home. Hold your hand up um, or just have two tabs open, one with your whole post and then a second tab, copy your hook and then copy your takeaway. Mm. Are your hook and your takeaway cohesive? If you read them back to back, do they make sense? If yes, you've done a good job. If no, you need to tie them together better. It's, it's kind of like a blog introduction and a blog conclusion. Like if you don't have the whole middle section, which is just the supporting evidence, like do the two introduce something and then leave you with the thought. Well, are they interconnected or not? Love that. Love that. Yeah. It's a uh, super important to think about the whole, the whole thing there and, and yeah. sort of how, how it's going to read. Um, so I wanted to pop up this one next. Uh, so uh, mm. this person was wondering about your book of hooks. Uh, they were asking, first of all, is it available on Amazon? Uh, and I believe the, feel free to answer here, but I, I know the, the one thing I want to mention was the hooked on writing hooks.com, the website that you, you share with me. Yeah. So the book of hooks, I know it has book in the title, but it was really just a bunch of chapters on notion. Um, and so <laughs> that, that's defunct. It doesn't, it doesn't really exist anymore. If you bought it, you know, a year ago, then, then you still have it. Um, but otherwise it morphed into hooked on writing hooks, which is this URL. Um, and that's the AI powered course. And you can totally buy it there. If you go to that website right now, you'll see that it says join waitlist. Um, I'm launching a new product later today, actually, hopefully if I can get all of my shit together, um, before the end of the day. And when I do that, I'm going to open up my other two courses, Hooked on Writing Hooks and Content Editing 101. And you could buy all three in a bundle for a discount, or you can buy them separately um, or not, or, or buy nothing. You don't absolutely never have to buy anything from me. But those are the options. You can join the wait list and then we'll email about it, or you can just wait until tomorrow where you'll be able to click buy now. Oh, Tyler, you're muted. I can't hear you anymore. Yep. There you are. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, we have we have we have uh, just about one minute left, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and cut things off there. Uh, I know there's a couple of questions, things that we did not get a chance to answer. Uh, as I already mentioned, if you have not already connected with Erica on Twitter and you have questions for her, or would like feedback, and and as she mentioned, she might even roast your hook for you directly on on Twitter if you want to send it her way. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Erica. It's been amazing. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, feel free to shoot me a DM on LinkedIn or tag me on Twitter. Uh, do my best to get to everyone. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Awesome. Well, uh, one more plug for uh, her website, hookedonwritinghooks.com, where you can check out uh, her existing products and her new forthcoming <laughs> product, uh, which uh, hopefully is coming out today. And uh, one more quick shout out to, uh, to Tofu. If you haven't already become a member, uh, join us there. Yes, optimist.com slash Tofu. Love to have you. 
All right. Uh, well, once again, Erica, thank you so much for taking the time today. This was amazing. Uh, learned so much and uh, it was, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Cheers. All right. See everyone on social. Thanks y'all. Cheers.